smart people are achieving so much from a couch that maybe I should be on the couch with them. But today, um, he's gonna talk about Collaborate and, and hopefully share some of the amazing things he's doing from Miami for about, oh, uh, I think, 100 cities he's impacting around the world. So um, just welcome Stoney for us if you could. Thank you. Thank you again, Malik. Um, honored and humbled to have the opportunity to share this morning with you all. And extremely grateful that you decided to wake up so early and to spend this beautiful morning in here with me to talk about collaboration. Um, and when Malik asked me to, to talk to, uh, to, to do this talk and told me that the topic was going to be collaboration, it, it seemed kind of at, at first glance off considering that I work in the venture capital industry, which is a very uh, nomadic industry. Even within firms, um, partners compete with each other over who found a deal that um, brought back the return on the fund, et cetera. And between venture capitalists, it's a very competitive space. Um, but having said that, there is a lot of collaboration that obviously within the firm has to happen. Um, between venture capitalists, you're investing with each other, you're following each other's investments, et cetera. Um, but Urban Us, my company, even deeper than that, leverages the collaborative power of working with a lot of people, um, even more so. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how Urban Us leverages people, um, but the real, the, the topic of, of this talk is actually going to be collaboration itself. Um, this, researching this talk allowed me to really dig in on what our secret sauce is, um, how we leverage collaboration, what I modestly would call successfully, and um, what that really highlights is the challenges that traditionally um, you'll face when trying to um, collaborate. Um, and whenever I'm trying to learn something more about anything, I first stop at Wikipedia, which in this case seems kind of meta, considering Wikipedia is one of the biggest collaborative platforms on the internet. Uh, looking up collaboration on there just seemed really cool. Um, and what I found was that the commonly accepted definition of collaboration is that it is a uh, working with others to do a task and to achieve a shared goal. So it's working with others, with so multiple people involved, to do a task, they're getting shit done, um, to achieve a goal. There's some big mission or vision that they're trying to uh, implement or bring to life. And why is collaboration important? Well, most things that are really important to solve require the power of many people. Some of the problems are just too big for one approach or one solution to ever even have a hope of having an impact. Sea level rise is something that we personally are becoming more and more aware of because in the number of decades, we may be swimming to work as opposed to walking to work. Or we may not have a home or a work to call that in Miami if we're uh, you know, underwater. Um, and sea level rise is, is particularly one of those things where we just haven't cracked that solution yet for Miami. Um, the conversation is actually now more how do we adapt? How do we build floating buses and boats for everyone to get around and just become accept the fact that we're becoming the next Venice? Um, but that, I think, to some degree that's necessary, but it's a little defeatist because there are still a number of things that we could potentially do. And the point is that groups like the Frost um, Museum uh, and uh, even artists uh, that are bringing awareness uh, with the, the, um, the high water line project that, that happened in Miami last year, I think all of those things are taking us closer and closer to really activating the collaborative thinking that's going to be necessary to solve sea level rise. And again, not to focus on sea level rise, but just to um, you know, highlight the importance that people get together to solve really big and hard problems. And sea level rise is just one of many of those really hard problems. And it's part of this group of problems that are really, really big and really, really important called climate change. The effects of climate change, in my opinion, in Al Gore's opinion, and many others' opinion, uh, we'll even talk a little bit about the Pope. Uh, climate change is one of the biggest challenges facing our species in the world. Um, it's also one of the things that more and more people believe we're, we have the most impact on. 
Um, aside from killing random animals, they should be killed. Um, but climate change is something that is happening, that's becoming more and more accepted. Um, and what's also becoming accepted is that together we can do something about it. And again, bringing, bringing us back to the question of how can we work together to solve challenges like the effects of climate change? And how do we not, pardon my French, fuck it up because it's too important. And when you think about collaboration, at least me, I think about a bunch of people sitting in a room with a whiteboard, writing on note cards, and co-creating ideas, and ideating creations, and they all feel like they got something done, and they walk out of the room and not much gets done from there. Um, there's a lot of studies now, we'll talk about some of them, that show that modern ways of thinking about collaboration just aren't effective. They're great for pointing out and finding ideas, but they aren't effective at implementing ideas. And there are a number of reasons why that we'll discuss, but I think there's one big missing piece, which is the piece that we've chosen to focus on um, and that I'd like to share with you. Going back to the title of, of my talk, um, Invisible Hand, it's a concept borrowed from uh, capitalism, um, which is the invisible hand of the market. How many people know or understand what that concept means? Anybody want to shout out, shout out what the invisible hand of the market is? when supply and demand will meet each other automatically uh, in a capitalist marketplace. So people will only supply whatever is required and demanded by it, and people will only demand what is uh, they require and not any more or any less. And that automatic matching in human behavior is the invisible hand of the marketplace. Thank you very much. So the invisible hand of the market is the principle that, um, as was eloquently stated, that brings the level of supply together with the level of demand based on people fulfilling their interests of either meeting a specific need or um, helping someone else meet a need in return for a profit. And we'll go back to that um, concept. Um, but in general, what's missing from collaboration based on studies from Psychology Today and Harvard Business School are the challenges that um, working together with people on the one hand makes you feel more positive and confident about what you're doing, but in some cases it's a false sense of confidence. Um, it's the sense that something is getting done even though you're really just get at the beginning stages of actually getting things done. Um, it introduces the pressure to conform. Just like any group thinking environment, people want to fit in innately and it's, it's so much easier and more comfortable to just go along with one leader in the group or to go along with consensus. So the real radical, innovative ideas that can come out of working together are often stifled. Um, it promotes laziness. There will often be folks in a group that just feel like everyone else seems to be working really hard and I can just ride along and let this thing materialize or I'll be called in to, to jump out of the helicopter and drop in when I'm actually needed. Um, and um, according to Harvard Business School, it's, as I stated before, ideal for creating ideas, but when you actually need to implement and execute certain ideas, in some cases being siloed, being alone, getting in your zone, in your space, executing on your specific task is critical to actually getting things done. So the antithesis of, of collaboration, which is send everybody off on their own. Um, and again, so going back to Wikipedia and looking at what is the definition, the commonly accepted definition of collaboration? It's working with others to do a task and to achieve a specific goal. And I, I want to focus on the key phrases in that sentence. Working with others to do a task and achieve a specific goal. Because I believe if we can dig in on those three key phrases and figure out what are the challenges that we face in trying to accomplish those three things, maybe we can make collaboration work a little bit better. So what are the challenges of working with others? Well, amongst many other things like dealing with each other's ego and laziness and the other things that were discussed, the work with us requires time and energy and alignment. Um, and oftentimes, well, in, in these times, some of those challenges can be met with modern tools, the internet. 
um, and the communication tools that the internet allows. So that challenge can actually be solved for. Maybe some of the cultural things need a little bit more work and some of the more innate things like conformity and laziness need more active work to, to actually push people past those challenges. Um, as far as doing a task, people, I think, when you have them in a room together, tend to be really excited and really gung-ho about, you know, tell me what to do, put me in, coach, I'll get it done. But once you send them off on their way, life happens. Most people have their own jobs and their own projects that they're working on. And for the most part, within a few hours, maybe even minutes after your collaborative session, they're back to doing whatever is the most important thing on their to-do list. And the tasks that were discussed go out the window until the next collaborative meeting to discuss what tasks weren't done and to pile on top of that list. So it's really hard to get people to do new things, um, even if it's for, even if it's after agreeing that everybody was going to do these things. And finally, achieving a specific goal is a tricky thing because goals need to be for, for people to stay motivated about a goal. They need to be big, obviously, because that's what really motivates people is something bigger than themselves. Um, but at the same token, if, if it's too big and people feel like, well, there's just no way we're ever going to completely solve the effects of climate change. But there's no way we're ever going to completely solve world hunger or um, world peace. Most people, after you know a few moments of self-reflection and realizing that this is a really big problem that they're probably not going to individually be able to contribute to solving, um, give up and feel like you know it's great to be a voice towards this goal, but there's not much I can really do about it. And on the other side of that, oftentimes the collaborative group will fall into another trap, which is one person or a few people will zoom in on a specific goal that impacts just that subgroup, a project that they're working on, a mission that they're very specifically focused on that's extremely personal. And that just tends to lose audio, um, groups as well because people slowly start to realize that, hey, I'm doing all this work to push this one specific person's um, motive forward and, and, and goal forward. So I think the proper sizing, right sizing goals is critical um, to making sure that people are able and willing to get through the challenges of working together, that they stay motivated beyond the collaborative meetings to actually achieve the tasks, and they believe that they're aligned, but also big enough, and or rather that the goal is consumable enough that they can actually get it done and make it happen. So Urbanus um, is a in a traditional sense of venture fund. Um, we buy equity into early stage companies. We have a very specific focus on companies that are making cities better. Um, but beyond just being a fund, we've also invested in building a global community of people who are interested in this same goal, making cities better through the power of startups. Um, and that group of people, which you know spans globally, not only helps us review the startups that we're looking at investing in and um, review some of the research that we're doing on the uh, on climate change, on startup ecosystems, et cetera, but they also help us advise and mentor and connect our startups to resources like customers and even more capital. So the tie-in to collaboration is it's really hard to get that many people to tune in, um, that many separate people with separate interests to tune in and to help push our agenda of making cities better through the power of startups. So I'm gonna share with you how we are able to accomplish that. Um, but first, I, again, to, to just highlight why cities are so important, um, we talked about climate change um, and how more and more people are starting to make climate change the most important thing uh, that we should be focusing on. Uh, the Pope, uh, the current city Pope of the, the Catholic Church, in fact, has made climate change his platform. Um, this was supposed to be the Pope of um, the poor, for the poor. And what he's come to is that the biggest challenge we're facing as a species is climate change. But beyond that, beyond dedicating his, his encyclical, the speech that he gives to one, the 1 1.2 billion Catholics around the world and activating, using that speech to activate those folks to focus on climate change, he also went on to organize uh, a, a meeting of mayors. Now, if it wasn't weird enough that the Pope is now a champion of climate change, you must be wondering why is he organizing mayors to talk about climate change? When you know the conversation about climate change traditionally has been about nations 
and carbon emission taxes, et cetera. But what's being realized more and more is that cities, um, it's been commonly said that cities are the biggest contributor to CO2 emissions. But interestingly enough that cities are also the most efficient per person per household on um, CO2 emissions, or per, per footprint per person. So more and more it's being realized that the climate change question is really an efficiency question. How we make cities more efficient. And then on the other side of that, if we don't solve the climate change, cities will be the first and will feel the impact of climate change, uh, the impact of, of climate change more pronounced. So it's, cities are a critical part of the conversation and mayors being the leader of cities seem to make sense to be you know, a focal point and the leaders of that conversation. Now, Urban House, we go a step further. Um, we think that the efficiency question is at the household or the condo unit layer and even more so at the individual um, layer. So if you're solving not for carbon emission taxes of nations, and you're not solving for policy decisions by mayors, what are you solving for? The way I look at it is we're solving for making people's lives better, or in other words, making their dreams come true. Um, how many of you saw Back to the Future 2 and um, the scene where they were chasing each other around on hoverboards? Okay, most of you. And that was a scene that captured the imagination of the world. One day we'll all be on hoverboards, riding, zipping around. And so uh, a year ago, I was at a conference, a hardware startup conference. And on the way out of the conference, I was exhausted done for the day, I saw a group of people riding around on this really wicked looking board that I had never seen before. Um, and I decided to give it a try, um, as clumsy as I am. Getting on that board was like nothing I had ever experienced. It literally felt like hovering above the ground. And despite falling all over myself, it really captured my imagination that the dream of having a hoverboard could finally materialize. Maybe not legitimately levitating over the ground, but that dream of being above the ground, floating over all the bumps and cracks, and not having to exert energy to get from point A to point B in a really fun way. So, I mean, at first you see this and you think, okay, so people you know, now get to have their hoverboards, um, they get to have fun and ride around with each other and you know, bust their butts every once in a while. But if you think about the challenges that we look at even in Miami, as far as transportation, and solving for those challenges of lack of public transportation all seem to have really big budget line item numbers, trillions of dollars, billions of dollars, um, large infrastructure changes, um, and the challenge, if you really look at it with Miami public transportation, it's not necessarily that it doesn't exist. It does exist. It just isn't as accessible as it is in other cities, maybe. But why isn't it accessible? Well, it's not accessible because normally from your home to public transportation, it's about two or three miles walking in the scorching sun. So. Even if you don't consider yourself lazy, I don't blame you for not wanting to walk in the sun for two or three miles to get to the public transportation. But what if you could have a hoverboard ride to that public transportation? How many more people would choose to leave their cars at home and take public transportation? And with that increased usage and the increased voice behind getting more routes into Miami, how many more routes would finally be deployed because the voice has grown that people are actually using public transportation? And again, going back to how this impacts climate change, on an efficiency level, if I can get you out of a car, and you and your family and the three million people in Miami out of their cars, we've dramatically changed the conversation about the carbon emissions coming from Miami and cities around the world. So that's why solving people's personal challenges, making people's personal dreams come true, is our, we believe that that's the route to solving for climate change and making cities better. So how do we actually do this? So I, one wheel came from a, a demo. Um, I went back to my co-founder and um, partner, Sean Abramson. Um, and as brilliant a guy as he is, and he literally is the most brilliant, one of the most brilliant um, thinkers in venture capital, in my opinion, um, he didn't see it at first. He again, like me, thought this was just a toy. Um, but we were able to convince each other enough that it was worth sharing in our bi-weekly newsletter. This is a newsletter that we send out to the folks in our network every two weeks. It's very straight to the point. It's an overview of two 
startups that we've run into that we really are excited about that we're considering investing in. We've dug in, we've written up an analysis of them. Here's an overview and here's a link to our blog that, that, that digs in on that startup. Um, that newsletter goes out to everyone in our network. We get about 60% opening click-through rates. Not always the same people, but you know, it's a good sampling of our network to see what more than half of the people um, think about what we're, what we're looking at. Um, normally, that, that, that newsletter points to research, but again, points to our blog, points to um, the startups that we, the, the two startups that we've analyzed, um, but also to all of the startups that we've ever analyzed um, and, and written up about. So the reason for um, directing folks to this uh, analysis is that for most people, the things that we run into are either not interesting or interesting to them. For everyone, actually. They're either interesting or not interesting. A hoverboard or an urban farm or whatever it is, a smart sprinkler system is either interesting or not interesting to you. And if you delete the email and you don't read it, you don't, that's fine. More than half the people find it interesting. From there, either you're working in something that's related to what One Wheel was doing, transportation, or maybe even you're just a board sport enthusiast. And what we ended up finding was one person in our network happened to be in the board sport industry and happened to personally really believe that skateboards and electrical skateboards and electrical personal mobility vehicles could be the catalyst to changing last mile mobility. And just hearing that feedback allowed us to start directing our thinking towards that end. How can we change the conversation about last mile mobility? And that's just one example of how one wheel came from a demo where I hurt myself to a conversation, to an email, to feedback from a network, a global network of folks, and eventually an investment in the company. Um, and they're now shipping their one wheel. I have one here if anybody wants to try it. That's how I get around. The power of why this works is the people that we have in our network. It's a very curated group of people. Um, I personally, interview most of the folks Sean and I, uh, some folks are Sean's personal and professional relationship from his past investments and co-investors from our current investments, but um, folks that apply to join the network, I generally do a call or meet with them and see what, what work they're already doing with startups or what work they're already doing in climate change or with cities. And if there's an alignment, then it makes sense. It's not to, it's, well, in part, it's to protect our time and energy of making sure we're working with people that can add value, but it's also to make sure that this doesn't become junk mail. The things that we're going to be talking about should very specifically be related to the work you're already doing or the interest you already have. And that's what we're really filtering for. And then once a person is part of the network, they have access to a directory of everyone else that's in the network. And so again, to further make sure that we are being cognizant and uh, focused on everybody's time and interests, we make sure that it's easy to find people that are relevant to your work, and that we make it easy for you to connect to those folks. So our founders can find advisors or other investors. Our investors can look at other founders that are in the network. Um, advisors and mentors can look for opportunities where they can plug in or be helpful, and vice versa with the startups looking for help. And we have folks in the network that are from the largest venture capital firms, um, from for companies like Google, um, and uh, from local governments all over the world, including Miami, Tel Aviv, and everywhere else you can think. And this becomes this really big, loose, unrelated, except on one or two key main goals, with this loose group of folks that we just ask them to pay attention once every two weeks and to chime in if anything's relevant to their work. The crux of the principle that we've built this system around, um, I think is resonated with a quote from Alexander Pope. Thus nature formed the general frame and bade self-love and social be the same. To me, that means that beyond giving someone a large, hairy goal that will keep them excited, people are generally motivated by self-love and self-interest. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Just like in the case of market efficiency and the invisible hand of the market, what makes that work is that everyone is trying to accomplish their self-interest. I want to sell, I need to buy something that me or my family needs. 
I want to sell something that I'm able to make, but I don't need all of it. Or I know that I can make it in an efficient way and make a profit, so then I can then turn around and get what me and my family needs. But it, it's all, that efficiency comes from the crux of self-interest. Why can't we apply that same principle to social good? And to collaborating on the big, hairy goals that we face as a species and as a society? We can. And we were designed to do just that. So I'm proposing that we focus on a new missing piece. Not really a new missing piece, but a very big missing piece that I don't think currently gets a lot of conversation when we're talking about collaboration, which is self. What are the individual self-interests of the folks you're collaborating with? How does the goal that you're collaborating on, that you're working on, align with that person's self-interest and what they're already doing? How are the tasks that they are being asked to do already aligned with the things that they would be doing anyway. It's working for us. Uh, we are now 750 folks around the world working again in venture capital, and private industry, large corporations, founders of startups, city officials. Together over the last two years, we've found and invested in and are now helping and working with 16, um, soon to be unannounced 18 startups that are solving things from lowering uh, or cutting back hundreds of millions of gall gallons of water usage around the country. Solving for things like helping neighbors help those in need in their neighborhood get off their feet to solve for the challenges of putting more people in the cities, which is one of them being poverty. We're solving for things like um, climate control within your home or your office. And making sure that that climate not only makes you feel good in a sense of physically comfortable, but also makes you feel good because you're saving money, you're not spending more money than you need to on your energy uh, bill. But you're also having a direct impact on CO2 emissions because of your reduced energy usage. And there are examples and examples that like this of how Personally motivated individuals, whether they're the consumer, the purchaser, they're the founder, the investor, all working on their self-interest, but still having huge impact on the environment and on cities. So how are we making collaboration work to solve these really big challenges? Again, we're making it really easy for everyone to work together, meaning we're not asking them to do much, just read an email and email us back or comment on a blog post. And we're not asking them to do anything that they aren't already doing. If you're already working with startups and that excites you, well, here's a startup that's solving water. Here's a startup that's solving waste. Here's a startup that's creating a hoverboard so that people can get to public transportation. Your work already being aligned with that makes it a very small leap for you to then take on one new project or to expand your brain share to one more thing that is even more interesting. So the tasks are easy, it's a light load. And of course, the feeling of knowing that as a group, even if you're not doing much, that you're still slowly pushing the needle and impacting the effects of climate change and making cities better, is something that keeps people motivated and keeps people paying attention. So it's big enough and hairy enough, but it's also consumed in small consumable bites. Um, I'm proposing that we do an exercise uh, I don't know how it'll actually work because there's a lot more people here than I thought would be, and I, again, humbly appreciate you guys coming up. Um, but the exercise and structure is this. We would break out into two groups. Um, each group would pick two leaders, so two groups, two leaders. We can do it in four groups, considering the size of the audience. Um, but each leader, or one leader, would pick one goal, whatever goal, and leader number two would pick two solutions to that goal. And everyone else would contribute to ideas about how that solution could work or how they can contribute to making that solution work. And um, you would offer help, ideas, connections, etc. And then finally, leader number one would pick one um, offer to help for, you know, implement one of the solutions to that goal. It's somewhat of a real world model of what, the way we work in urban us. Is it feasible to pull off an exercise like that? I'm breaking creative morning protocol. 
what we can do is I can wrap up and we can talk amongst ourselves and actually practice this exercise. I think it'll be, it'll really um, be eye-opening to focus on a big goal that people can contribute, how their self-interest can be aligned with that goal and with the tasks necessary. And I'd love to hear about what you guys come up with. Here, outside of here, I'm really curious in learning more about how people's self-interest, how your self-interest is helping make cities better or solving any other large area problem. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, 
everyone, if you go on our website, we have this cool new thing where we're creating the graphic using the community. So if you visit our website, you'll find a remix me um, uh, sort of collaborative graphic making program on there. That's the easiest way I can describe it. Uh, but we are trying to have fun everywhere we go. This is a completely philanthropic venture. Everyone here uh, sort of donates their time and their services. So I can't leave without saying thank you to a bunch of people. First and foremost, the Miami Design District. We love coming here. Tiffany's here right now. Carla's here. Sandra helped us put this together. This space is really brand new to the point where this isn't the way it's going to finally look. Um, they're going to wrap it in some cool material. But that's how much um, how cool they are. They're like, you want to use the newest, newest, newest space we have? It's like, do you want to babysit my brand new baby? And we're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and so we, we, we love coming here. We thank the Miami Design District for um, always helping us. Bunny cakes for the delicious cupcakes. If you didn't get one, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw some people double fisting, so you can blame them. Uh, box water for keeping it fresh. Uh, and of course, uh, I have like two co-founders, one was here, and then a uh, partner, one is Catalina. If you haven't been on our website or our Facebook, you're going to know where to look on the website. And she's just amazing at capturing photos. So if you need something in your life captured, this is the person to call. And then Pascal back there on the uh, video. Pascal and his amazing eye that we're able to do this. So once again, if you need your life captured in motion, that's the guy to talk to for sure. And just the entire Great Mornings team just want to say thank you to them. And uh, go online, look at our videos. And next month, which is I guess tomorrow, the theme is action. And the next event is going to be at the Viscaya with Nathaniel Sandler, who if you know him, he's, a, he's, he's the most awesome troublemaker in the city. And he's at multiple locations doing multiple awesome projects. So a week from now, we're going to put up the tickets so you can sign up there and have a great weekend.